Okay, Professor Boyer, author of Religion Explained in 2001. What do religions, beliefs uh, across the world have in common and uh, why do they spread so easily? Okay, well, uh, what they have in common, I must first say that they are extremely diverse, of course, you know, we see all sorts of diversity. One um, of the major kinds of things that they have in common is that they all postulate the existence of agents. There's agents that there can be gods, spirits, ancestors, you know, uh, things like that. Um, those agents, let's call them the gods, that's simpler, um, have knowledge of what we are doing, we mortals. Uh, they also have special qualities that make them very special, like for example, ghosts, you know, uh, are physically strange, they don't go to, they can go through walls or do things like that. Gods are everywhere at the same time, or, um, you know, all sorts of properties of this kind. And, and one main uh, characteristic that we find in almost all religious traditions is that those agents are not just strange and special in that way, they also have a mind, and that mind happens to be very, very similar to human minds. So, for example, they have memories, they have intentions, they want things, and if they want those things, they want to go through the means to achieve those goals. Um, and these are properties that we find absolutely everywhere. Now, the question why this is widespread the world over, um, that's the major question that psychologists of religion and cognitive scientists of religion are trying to answer. So it's not like we have the definitive answer. But what we think is that there are all sorts of conditions that uh, make those beliefs very easy to acquire and very easy to transmit. And basically we have these beliefs because of the way our normal human, human minds work. Uh, we are disposed to think of agents all the time. Agents are the only thing that matters in our existence because we depend on other uh, people, on other humans. Um, but also, um, probably the fact that those agents are construed as, or conceived as agents with very special powers uh, makes them both arresting, interesting, attention-grabbing, on the one hand, which attracts people's attention, uh, but also the fact that they have normal minds make them very good explanations for all sorts of things that happen to us and also make it very difficult, very, sorry, very easy to interact with them because if they have a mind we can, for example, offer them sacrifices and they will be well disposed towards us. Uh, if they have a mind they will remember that we did that. Uh, if they have a mind they will see that we are making efforts to be, you know, better than other people and things like that. So we think because of the way our minds work, that kind of belief is likely to be easily acquired, uh, easily stored in memory, easily communicated to other people. And if that is the case, then that means that over generations these beliefs become more and more widespread in any human culture. And this is called the byproduct theory, yes. right? And it is uh, often put against the adaptationist theory, sure. isn't it? Sure. Yes, there are two ways of seeing, of looking at these things. And of course, it's not any specific argument or experiment that can settle this kind of uh, dispute between two perspectives. It's the accumulation of lots of evidence. So some people say, well, um, religions and um, the, 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 exist, the idea of gods who can see us, can punish us, and so on, is a very good trick to organize um, large societies because large societies depend a lot on coordination and cooperation between people. And therefore, if you have these kinds of beliefs, you also have some sort of idea that uh, failure to coordinate with other people or defection, cheating, um, are ultimately not a great strategy. So that's the uh, sort of... Uh, very simplified adaptationist theory. And the byproduct account is what I just said, which is that many religious ideas are there just because we have the kind of minds that acquire that. So that would be, in a way, the same idea as saying that um, uh, lots of, uh, that for example, we have sweets because you know, the way our system works makes sweet substances more 
uh, palatable than others, or we have um, uh, we like paintings with symmetry because the way our visual system is uh, organized, we uh, detect symmetry. So architecture that has symmetry seems more pleasing to us than other things. Um, the byproduct sort of interpretation tends to say that religion is much less important than you think. Uh, the adaptationist, adaptationist story tends to say, well, it's even more important than you might have, might have thought because it was necessary for building uh, large societies. At the moment, no one knows which of these is really true, but people are, of course, in each of these camps, accumulating evidence, you know, and studies and all that to show that, you know, we have the explanation, we're really on the right side. Um, if I had to bet any money, I don't know which way I would bet. Okay, so, but I don't have much money to bet, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> And I would like to ask you also um, to tell something about another term you use, that is informal religious activity. What do you mean by it? Right, so I was trying to um, describe the kind of religious activities that we have, uh, that we find in almost everywhere in the world, um, that is not part of the organized religions with churches, with congregations and things like that. Um, these are activities that um, occur, for example, uh, with possession, with shamanism, uh, with um, healing, uh, trance, and things like that. And all these things are phenomena that we find in all human societies. They are generally repressed by organized religions. And they're also very likely the kind of religious activities that we had, we humans had, before we had large societies and before we had organized religion. So I, I call that informal religious activities, but really um, it uh, groups together all sorts of things that people used to call shamanism, um, healing, uh, possession, uh, but also um, expertise like diviners and things like that. Another question, what kind of religious activity occurred in our ancestral environments, is it possible to assess something like that? Uh, right, well, um, archaeologists would say that, well, to some degree, we, we, we can make guesses about that. Uh, but I think, uh, um, in the sense that, you know, there are rock paintings, there are artifacts that seem to have some correspondence to what we now call some kind of shamanism, understood in a very broad sense. Um, but I think a very simple test of what we had before is first to think what what is almost certainly not there. And what is not there are religious organizations with priests, uh, doctrines, um, uh, large uh, institutions. And the reason for that is that simply there, was no, there were no means to have any of that. So what we find in all societies that have small-scale tribal organization is we find these kind of shamanism-like activities or ancestor cult, which are very local, uh, activities. There are no large, powerful gods, but local spirits and ancestors. Um, there are no churches, but or in the sense of organizations, but there are specialists who are individuals who have special qualities. Um, and also the main difference is that the focus of all those, those activities is pragmatic. It's always to address misfortune or to make sure that misfortune does not happen. That's the only point. Um, understanding the cosmos, understanding morality, the origin of the world or whatever, that is absolutely not the sort of thing uh, that we find in any place except where you have religious organizations. So, one thing at least we know is that that kind of combination of doctrines, priests, things like that, that did not exist. And by default what is left is the informal kind of religion. But of course we can't be sure. <laughs>